excited about this series. Are you? Do you want to hear about those stories? Anybody? Is it just me? You know, the, it, the, the series is called Jesus Stories, and it's new insights into an old narrative. You know, some of these stories, especially if you grew up in church, you've heard these stories a thousand times. And sometimes when we've heard something over and over and over, it kind of starts to lose its awe. But one of the goals that I have this coming year is to get to know Jesus in a deep and intimate way. So um, I'm going to do my regular Bible reading, but I'm going to stay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in the Gospels in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'm just going to hang out with Jesus this year. Anybody want to join me in that? Woo! Woo! And also, um, I think, uh, anybody else, well, don't raise your hand if you're doing the 21-day fast because then you lose your rewards. But uh, <laughs> I just want to say I am a mess here. Um, sorry. The, uh, the benefits of prayer and fasting are ridiculous in a good way. Um, you know, you don't have to necessarily do a full fast I mean, you can, but fasting from, you know, say, say if you do a Daniel fast, which is just, just eating fruits and vegetables. Um, I was just talking to a friend of mine, and he said that at their church, they, uh, they did a Daniel fast, which is supposed to be just fruits and vegetables. But I guess the pastor, his name was Danny, and they said that he was so loosey-goosey with this Daniel fast, they started calling it the Danny fast. <laughs> um, but you can fast other things too. I mean, um, and just set aside that time. And even if you didn't start with us on January 10th, you can still join us now. It's not too late. Um, if you have any questions about fasting, I mean, there, we have a lot of different resources. I would, I would love to recommend that you look into it because I've literally seen strongholds broken. Um, my husband's not here to defend himself, but he... Um, he actually got delivered from porn after he did a three-day fast. Um, I've seen people delivered from all kinds of strongholds and bondages. So don't ever underestimate the power of, of fasting and prayer. You don't want to just, it's not a diet, okay? So just remove that idea from your mind. It's not a diet, but it's a way that you deprive yourself, your flesh, in order to say, God, I want you to do something new in my spirit. Amen? So um, welcome, everybody. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to bring this new message. I did want to say welcome to those who are joining us online. Last week, I stayed home and watched online first service, and then I came and was here for second service when Kelly preached. And I know there are those of you who are sick. I think there are a lot of people that are sick with COVID right now, so we are going to pray for them. Um, but if you have the option to come, please come back because it is so different. It's a really different experience. It's so easy to just get distracted if you're watching online, and I know there's a special grace for those of you who, who are unable to make it. But would you guys join with me in praying? We have, we have several people who have COVID right now, um, a lot of the people from our Jesus Feeds ministry, and so we actually have to shut it down this week. So um, would you guys join with me in praying for them? Well, Father, we come into your presence and we thank you. We're grateful that you are good. We're grateful that you know all things, and we, um, we thank you that your word tells us that we should ask, God, that, that if someone is sick, we should ask. And so we do come to you uh, we ask for your healing for those who have COVID, for those who are sick in other ways. And we are so grateful that you're good, and we're grateful that you're faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so with this particular series, I'm going to be having some guests come up and help me. Um, not today, but um, starting next week, we're going to start to kind of do a little bit of an experiment. We're going to try to, to bring some other voices to the table to share their favorite Bible stories or their favorite Jesus story. But this is one of my favorite stories today. Um, uh, but before we get into that, I, I just wanted to give you a little history lesson. So one of our founding fathers is named Thomas Jefferson. Anybody ever heard Thomas Jefferson? 
How many of you have heard that Thomas Jefferson was a Christian? Uh, Thomas Jefferson was not a Christian. He was a deist, which means that he believed in a higher power and he believed Jesus was a good teacher. But what Thomas Jefferson did is he said that he didn't believe in anything supernatural. He didn't believe in any of the miracles, nothing. So he actually took his scissors, cut out any accounts in his Bible. He cut out any accounts of any miracles or anything supernatural that Jesus did. And he said what he was doing was removing the diamond from the dung hill. Now check this out. This is called the life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth extracted textually from the gospels. Could you have a longer title for a book? But this is a quote. Try to try to hang with me. The language is a little a little archaic, but this is from a book called In God We Trust by Norman Cousins. It says, when we have done away with the incomprehensible jargon of Trinitarian arithmetic, which is saying the Trinity, as in that three are one and one is three, when we've knocked down the artificial scaffolding reared to mask from view the simple structure of Jesus, when in short we shall have unlearned everything that has been taught since his day, and got back to the pure and simple doctrines he inculcated, we shall then be truly worthily his disciples. First of all, did anybody understand that? (laughs) Basically, what this is saying is we need to tear down all of these things that have been built up saying that Jesus is something other than what he is in their estimation. You know, basically, there was, a, there was an organization called the Religious Historical School, and they came against anything supernatural whatsoever, and they tried to discount the Bible, saying that, well, because we can't explain these miracles, obviously they can't be real. Anybody, anybody want to serve a God who's, who is impotent in being able to do a miracle? I heard a great quote this last week. If you can understand your God, he's not a God worthy of being worshipped. Now that isn't like you can't know things about him, but if you could fully understand God, do you think that God would be the kind of God that you would want to give up your whole life for? I mean, most of us can't even understand our spouse. (laughs) How can we understand the God of the universe, the God who spoke the heavens and the earth into being with a word? How could we ever be so arrogant to think that we can explain who God is fully? I'm not saying you, I mean, there are certainly aspects of him that we can understand. For example, we can understand that he's a God of forgiveness. We can understand that his character is that of goodness and faithfulness and righteousness and justice. I mean, we can know about him, but you cannot fully comprehend an eternal God. And it is arrogant for for these people to think that they can, or that they could just dismiss all the miracles that are accounted for in the Bible, even though there are many, many witnesses, you know, even, well, okay, so there's two miracles in the Bible that are contained in all four of what are called the Gospels. The Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So these are, are four different accounts of the life of Jesus. And, you know, a lot, of, a lot of these people that are trying to tear down the truth of the Bible will say, well, you know, there are different, they tell different details and they tell, you know, different aspects and different elements of the story. Well, that's part of the beauty of it. It would be like, so you four, you experience something, you, you witness, let's say, an accident. And then I come to you and I say, well, what happened, Alyssa? You would tell me your account, Zeb, what happened? You would give me your account, Sarah, Prentice. You see, each one would give their own particular distinction based on their personality and based on, obviously, the the Holy Spirit. I mean, because if they all told the exact same story, it would be a quad redundancy, (laughs) right? So, So what brings Jesus fully to life is that he is described by these four different accounts and different people. And there are only two miracles in all four of the Gospels that are, that are accounted for in each one. 
If you were in first service, you don't get to answer this question. Anybody want to take a stab at what the two miracles that are contained in all four of the Gospels are? Somebody first service said water into wine. You guys in your wine. Come on. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yes. Jesus feeds a 5,000, and what's the other one? The resurrection. Ah, yeah. I'd say that's a miracle. A guy's dead, and he comes back to life. I would call that a miracle. I wouldn't cut that out of my Bible, would you? Okay, so today, we're going to save talking about the resurrection for Easter Sunday, because it's Resurrection Sunday. But today we are going to delve into Jesus feeding the 5,000. Now, this is in all, like I said, it's in all four of the Gospels. It's in Mark chapter 14. It's in, or I mean, I'm sorry, Matthew 14 and Mark 6, Luke 9, and John 6. We're going we're gonna to take it from John's perspective. Now, keep in mind, John was kind of like Jesus' homie. He was kind of like Jesus' best friend. Not that Jesus showed favoritism, but... John, John referred to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. So this is coming from his perspective, this story. Now, I do want to say this too. You know, some people say, well, how come some accounts say 4,000 and some say 5,000? Because Jesus could do this more than once. So there are different details. So that means this isn't just a one-off. This is something that Jesus did at least twice. Who knows if he did it more? But keep in mind, anytime you hear a story about Jesus, it's not just a surface level. Now, you remember the Bible is descriptive. It explains what happened historically, but it's also prescriptive. And that means how does it apply to our lives? So we're going to talk descriptively today about how Jesus fed the 5,000, but we are also going to talk prescriptively how we can apply this to our own lives and how we can understand how feeding 5,000 people 2,000 years ago applies to my life today. So now if you just take it at surface level, you'd be like, okay, that was cool. Yeah, okay, Jesus did this miracle. But I can tell you, this applies to your life. This applies to your life today. So <clears throat> let's start. If you have your Bible, um, in John chapter 6, this is the New Living Translation that I'm reading out of. We're going to, um, actually, you know what? I'm just going to tell you this story, okay? And then we'll get into it. We'll, we'll get into it line upon line. But So John the Baptist, who was a relative of Jesus, some say his cousin, um, he had come against Herod who was like a ruler, like a really big deal, because Herod was apparently a pervert, and he had this young girl do a dance for him, and he did all kinds of things that were really sketchy, and so he ended up getting beheaded. So Jesus is just coming off that experience, and he was really sad. And he's telling his disciples, hey, you guys, let's just go to the other side of the lake, and let's just kind of debrief. Let's just kind of talk about what's going on. Let's, let's have a core group meeting. Let's have a community meeting. Um, and so they went on, they went to the other side, and all of a sudden they look up, and there's like droves of people coming toward them. And Jesus, being completely exhausted, of course said, um, you guys, I need my own personal time. So... No, Jesus did a miracle. Even in his exhaustion, even, even in the fact that he was grieving and that he was not in a place, I think this is such a powerful example for us to serve sometimes when we just plain old don't feel like it. Right? Here come these thousands of people that are needy. And rather than Jesus going, you know what? I just don't have the capacity to deal with you all right now. He, in this way, demonstrated what it means to lay down your life for someone else. So then, Philip comes up to him 
And, and Jesus is like, hey, I think you should feed all these people because they've come a long way and they're probably really exhausted. So we should feed them. And Philip, who's probably the analytical one of the group, he's probably the mathematician, he's like, um, you know what? It would literally cost half a year's wages for us to feed these people. So I want you to think about how much money you make a year. Some of you are going to break down and cry, but <laughs> think about how much money you make in a year and cut that in half. That's how much they said that this one meal would cost for everybody to get a single bite. That's pretty intense. So let's say you make $60,000 a year. This meal would have cost $30,000 for everybody to get one bite. Because it's not only, it's 5,000 men, but that, that is not even counting the women and the children. So some scholars say it's up to 20,000 people. Can you imagine? And so all of a sudden, um, Andrew comes up and he's like, hey, there's this little kid and he's got these He's got these five little barley loaves and he's got these two fish and he said he'd be willing to share them. And so all the other disciples are probably like, oh yeah, okay, perfect. Everybody can get literally less than a crumb. But what does this say about who this little guy is? Barley was the food of the poor. So they said lentils was the food for the rich, but barley was the food of the poor. So this is literally the least likely person that they would have to be the one to provide for everyone. Not only is he a helpless little kid, He's also poor, and he's only got five barley loaves and two fish. And so Jesus is like, you know what? It's okay. Have everybody sit down. And, and then he starts, like, pulling out the food, and it just never stops. So much so that they had leftovers. Anybody fan of leftovers? <laughs> they had leftovers. And Jesus is like, don't let this be wasted. So let's dig into it. Let's dig into it verbatim. Um, John chapter 6, starting with verse 1. After this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went. Now, this is one reason why they kept following him. Because they saw his miraculous signs. Keep the word signs in mind. They saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. So what this implies to me is that some of the people were coming to Jesus with ulterior motives. They weren't necessarily coming because they wanted to hear him teach or they wanted to grow or they wanted to learn. They were coming because they wanted something from him. It says, um, where am I? As he healed the sick, it says, then Jesus climbed a hill and he sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. It says, Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? So they were so far away from like the nearest grocery store. I mean, there was like no way they were going to have food. They had traveled for miles in a, in a pretty rugged area. And there was no possibility that they were going to be able to go out to like 7-Eleven or something and buy snacks. It's like they were in a remote area. And it says, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? Okay, again, everything in these stories is symbolic. Everything. Because it's talking about bread. Well, what does the Bible say about bread? It says Jesus is the bread of life. It says that the word of God is, is better than bread. It says, it says that you don't live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. And that's what Jesus is demonstrating here, that he's going to meet their physical needs, but he's also going to meet their spiritual and emotional needs as well as he feeds them. I mean, I know now it's not cool to eat bread because of the gluten and whatever. <laughs> Apparently, the only bread that it's okay to eat is sourdough. That's the new heart healthy or healthy gut, whatever. Yeah, I know. I was shocked too with tons of butter, cherry gold butter. But back in those days, that is what they ate. They ate bread. And I'm sure they ate a lot of 
you know, fresh produce as well. But bread was easy to carry. You know, they could bake it up in the morning and carry it. And then the fish, it wasn't like that, you know, like canned tuna or something. This was like, like kind of pickled, like sardine kind of fish. Oh, by the way, here's another little quiz. What kind of fish did Jesus eat? Anybody know? Tilapia. It's not a joke. It's actually tilapia. That's the kind of fish that they think that Jesus ate. So for all of you fish haters, try some tilapia. Maybe you'll like it. (laughs) Okay, so bread. Back to bread. I really went off on a tangent on that one. So bread is a really significant thing because you, you could not in those days live without bread. That was, that was a staple, but yet Jesus is the bread of life. And he's saying that if we learn of him and consume of, from him, we will never be hungry again. Okay, it says here, um, hey, Philip, where should we buy bread for all these people to eat? And it says he only asked this to test him because he already had in mind what he was going to do. I love this. This is such a classic Jesus move. It's like Jesus could have just gone and created like fishes and loaves. But instead, he included an imperfect human being in his miracles. And I believe that's what Jesus wants to do today, is he wants to include us in his miracles. He wants us to get to participate with him in miracles as we, as we lay hands on people and see them get healed, because we still do believe that today, that you can be physically healed. You can be emotionally healed. You can be spiritually healed. But we also believe that through teaching the word of God, people can be transformed You can be completely transformed. And how many of you know that this pandemic that we have has stirred everything up? You know, there's no such thing as BC before coronavirus. We're never going back. And I I know that I say this and it probably bothers some people, but stop waiting to go back to what it was like. Jesus is doing a new thing. He wants to do a new thing in us, and he wants to partner with us in seeing his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And he wants us to have life purpose. He wants us to be fulfilled in him because we cannot be fulfilled in anything else. And the only bread that will satisfy is Jesus Christ. That is the only bread that will satisfy. Because how many of you have ever done a carb load and then when you crash, it's nasty, right? Anybody remember the episode of The Office, The Rabies Awareness, when Michael Scott did the carb load? (laughs) For those of you who don't watch The Office, I apologize, but he, he ate like this huge plate of fettuccine Alfredo right before he did a 5K. Was it a 5K? Yeah. So, But that kind of bread goes away. So Jesus is going to feed these guys the kind of bread that doesn't last. It doesn't sustain. It'll only sustain them for a while. But Jesus is saying, I want you to participate with me in feeding people the kind of bread that's going to last throughout eternity. And that's what he has for us. And I believe that if you're in the hearing of my voice, if you're in this room, Jesus is inviting you right now. He's saying, hey, I want to partner with you in seeing people's lives transformed. I want to partner with you in seeing miracles. I want you to believe that I, the God of the universe, can do miracles, and I want you to join with me. Anybody up for that? That's what he's calling us to. So he asked Philip. He already knew. Jesus could have done this on his own. Incidentally, back to the the guys that try to discount the miracles. So there are these different accounts that say, well, actually what happened was Jesus just kind of did this whole, like he kind of put on this show, but in the back, he had a whole bunch of food back there. And then he just said that, that he, that, how are we going to feed all these people? And then he, he knew because he had stored it back there and then they were just going to, they just started bringing all this food out and they were just going to start feeding all these people. Some people try to explain this miracle away. 
Another way people try to explain this miracle away is they're like, what was truly miraculous was that this little boy so selflessly gave up his lunch and that when he did that, everyone else was so deeply moved that they took out the lunch that they had been hiding. And everyone shared. And, and the miracle is really the benevolence of humanity. How many want to serve a God who's like a deceiver? And No, thank you. I want to serve a God of miracles. Don't you? I want to serve a God who can transform a life like he transformed my life. That's why I know it's possible. That's why I know it's possible because he, you know, I remember having a discussion with somebody one time and they were saying to me, well, if God is a God of miracles, why doesn't he take one of these mountains and throw it into the heart of the sea? And I'm like, well, that would be a a terrible waste. Take one of those beautiful mountains and throw it into the sea? I said, how about the life of your son who was transformed? He was in the gutter. He was an alcoholic and a drug addict and a drug dealer and a broken, broken man. And Jesus transformed his life and he became the pastor of the Adventure Church. What about that? Yeah, glory to God. To me, that's a practical miracle if that's not an oxymoron. But it is. It's, it's like, wouldn't you rather have somebody's life transformed than have them see like this one-shot kind of miracle deal that is cool for the time? I mean, the miracle, the true miracle, is that God wants to change our lives. He wants to save not only our souls, but he wants to transform us from the inside out. And he wants to give us purpose. He wants to partner with us and give us a mission. Okay, so here it says, Philip answered him, hey, that would take a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a single bite. So this is like, this is like saying there's no possible way that we're going to be able to feed these people. But in verse 8, it says, another of his disciples, Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother, he spoke up and he introduces this boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But he too is saying, but how far will they go among so many? And Jesus said, in classic Jesus, he, you ever notice how Jesus doesn't answer? He doesn't always answer the question directly. Do any of you struggle with that even today? You're like, Jesus, why don't you do such and such? Why don't you bring me a wife? Or why don't you, you know, and, and Jesus doesn't answer us directly. Anybody know that's still how he is today? So Jesus doesn't answer the question, but he says instead, have the people sit down. And again, sitting down is a posture of learning. They want to learn. In those days, people would sit down as a, as a sign, like, I want to hear from you. I want to hear what you have to say. And so they sat down. It's because it, there was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. Again, 5,000 men, not including women and children. Um, and Jesus took the loaves, he gave thanks, and he distributed it to those who were seated. Get this, as much as they wanted. Jesus did an all-you-can-eat miracle. As much as they wanted. And see, that's the, that's the way Jesus is for us. Because it says if you seek him, you will find him. And the more diligently you seek him, the more you will find him, the more he will reveal himself to you. You know, again, BC, there was a thing called cultural Christianity. This is where people would want to come to church and they would just want to, you know, get their, kind of get get the good feels and, you know, and kind of check it off their to-do list. And I'm a good person. I went to church. But the coronavirus has changed all that. The, the casual cultural Christian is not going to survive in the church because I believe the church is going to enter into a season of persecution. I mean, American Christianity has just been so easy. I mean, the hard thing has been to give up our comfort. But I believe Jesus is, is calling a remnant to raise up an army. And he wants us to be full on for him. And he wants to participate with us, but he does want us to sit down in his presence on a daily. 
not as something you check off your to-do list. Um, I'm going to get kind of vulnerable here um, and give you a little insight into my life. Um, somebody had mentioned to me, you know, I always, I'm always talking about the presence of God, talking about, you know, it's so important to get into the presence of God. I'm going to just kind of give you a little insight into um, my time with Jesus. Um, and now this is, <clears throat> this is not a formula. I'm not saying this is how you have to do it. But what I will say is figure out who you and Jesus are together. Figure out your relationship with him. Because you know, you have, you have different relationships with different people, with different friends, right? Jesus wants to have a unique relationship with just you and him. He wants to hang out with you. And I'll just confess, I struggled for so many years with the, with the concept of quiet time or devotions or whatever, time with the Lord. I struggled because I tried to turn it into like this formula. I tried to imitate other people. I tried to do it, you know, the way that I thought was the most holy way. And, and, I, and I wrestled and I walked around with all this shame and all this guilt. And Jesus is not about that. Jesus died for your shame. Jesus doesn't want you to feel guilty, but Jesus does want to fulfill you in time with him. And, and, you know, it's like the old saying goes, quality time only comes through quantity time. You know, you can shoot up some arrow prayers now and then, and you can just, you know, maybe read, I'm going to read a verse quickly before I go and then go to work. And, but I challenge you, I challenge you in this new season of your life because tomorrow's a blank page. Determine what your relationship is going to be like with Jesus because it's only through Jesus that you can be transformed by the renewing of your mind because he wants to change your mind about some things. He wants to purify your mind. He wants to make your mind sharp for him and discerning so that you can recognize. You can walk in a room and you can recognize spirits and you can come against them in the spiritual realm. Does that sound exciting? And you'll be able to have words of wisdom to speak to people that are broken and hurting and lost. And I am all about the significant conversation. Those of you who know me, you know I like to have deep conversations. I'm not, I'm not great at chit-chatting. I, I want to go deep. In the aquarium of life, I'm a bottom dweller. I like to talk deep. Because we could be dead tomorrow, right? So let's make today count. Don't be waiting. Especially, let me just talk to my tribe in the front row. You guys, life goes so fast. I feel like I'm your age. I don't look like it, but I feel like it. Oh, come on. I feel like I am. And it just goes so fast. Make the most of your time for these days are evil. Sit down in the presence of Jesus and let him speak to you. So this is how I, this is how I do my, my quiet time or my devotional time or whatever. So what I typically like to do is I like to get up before the sun comes up. Some of you are already checked out. <laughs> You're like, well, it's not me. And that's fine. Um, but, I, but I like to... Um, I like to have the sun be the first light that I see in the day, so I try not to like look at screens. Or It's hard to make coffee in the dark, I've noticed, though. But um, So what I'll do is I will, I will um, either go outside and take off my shoes and stand and watch the sun come up over the mountains because it says that the, that the heavens are his craftsmanship. And let me tell you, for those of you who, who sleep in, you're missing out on Jesus does a unique art project every morning just for you. Yesterday, I was, in, I was in L.A. this week, and there was the most amazing sunrise. It was like this fuchsia, and then it just kind of dissipated into like a pastel. It was just amazing. And I can do nothing but just worship him and say, blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, the creator who holds everything in his hands. And I just worship him. It's not like a formula. I just like 
tell him how awesome he is. And then I will um, take my, I'm auditory learner, so I'll take my, my phone, my Bible app or whatever, and I'll just sit and listen to his word. Just sit and let his word speak to my heart. And then I'll pray, just hang out with him, talk with him. And then I'll, you know, I'll just like open my hands and say, Lord, my life is yours. Fill me today. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your presence. Guide me and lead me today. Just offer myself to him. Like that little boy. That little boy took everything he had and he offered it to Jesus. And Jesus wants us to do the same. Jesus wants us to do the same exact thing, to give him all we've got. With our time, He wants us to serve other people, even when we're tired, even like he was tired. He was tired, he was grieving, he was exhausted, but he still served. And he wants us to serve. You know, if you you call yourself a Christian, then that implies that you serve somebody else other than yourself. Because that's the way you come to understand who Jesus is, the one who laid down his life for us, is when we lay down our lives for others. And Jesus wants us to use our talents. He wants to give him all we've got in our talent. Like, what do you love doing? What are you good at? What can impact people's lives? You know, what are your spiritual giftings? Are you an intercessor? Are you a person who loves to pray? And you you sit and watch behind the scenes? Or are you a person who, who is an exhorter? You're, you're an encourager. You just, you love to encourage people. Let God, have all that you are. Give him all you've got in your encouragement and in your gifts and in your calling and also in your cash. You know, give him all you've got. It's like all of God's money belongs to him. Every cent, everything you have comes from his hand. And if you are a Christian, If you call yourself by the name of Jesus, you've got to recognize that our God is a generous God. He is an extravagantly generous God. So please don't be possessed by your possessions. And that means money. That means tithing. You know, 10% is is like a good place to start. Jesus says, test me in this. But if you're stingy with your money and you hoard your money and you're worried about money and then you expect God to bless you, that's not going to happen. I mean, you might have money, but you won't have the ability to enjoy it. If you're not possessed by your possessions, but rather you just trust that everything belongs to God, you are going to give it freely and God is going to give you more. It's like the law of gravity. And I'm not a prosperity preacher, but I am a prosperity teacher in this, that Jesus says that if we are generous, we will prosper. It says a generous man will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Start to be generous. Start to, start to give extravagantly so that it doesn't even make sense. And I, and, I, and I do challenge you, start to give 10% back to the Lord. 10% is, is nothing compared to 100%. And Jesus just wants us to give everything we have, all that we've got to him in every way, in every aspect of our lives. Because what is the first and greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Therefore, if it's a commandment, it means it's possible for us to be able to do it. It is possible for you to lose your entire life for Jesus. And in doing so, to find it. And he's asking, give it all you've got. Give me everything you've got. And I will blow you away with my provision. As a matter of fact, verse 12, when they had eaten all that, all that they had, they'd eaten enough. It says, gather the pieces, let, let nothing be wasted. They gathered and filled 12 more baskets. I mean, there's a lot of symbolism in that too, but we don't have time. 12 more baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves that were left over, even after these thousands and thousands of people had eaten. And here it says again, the people saw the sign 
that Jesus had performed. Why don't you stand with me today? How many of you got something out of this today? How many of you want to give it all you've got? You know, it says, don't don't be stingy toward God. He gave you life. And he gave you life eternal. If you've accepted the sacrifice that Jesus offered when he went to the cross and paid the penalty for your sins so that you would not have to suffer eternal punishment, he gave it all. Legit, he gave it all. And he's asking us, give me your barley loaves and your fish and watch what I can do. He's saying, give me your insecurities. Give me your gifts. Give me your abilities. Give me your heart. Give me your time. And watch me blow you away with how I multiply it, how I impact people. Some of you in this room could literally impact nations. Some of you could be church planters and you could impact thousands and thousands of people. Some of you could be political leaders sometime, someday. Please. <laughs> you, guys, you guys can be world changers. But you got to give it all you got. Don't hoard it. Don't hold it back. Go full on for Jesus. Right? You guys in? We're going to pray. Well, Jesus, we are full on for you, Lord. We want to give it all we've got. Lord, we don't want to withhold anything from you. A God of grace and mercy and peace. The God who has graciously given us all things. You didn't withhold anything from us. And we just thank you, Lord, and we praise you. And Lord, we commit to you today, right now. Lord, I'm going to give it all I've got. Can you just say that to him right now? Say, Lord, I give it all I've got. Lord, you hear these prayers. You love these people. Thank you for your love. Thank you, Lord, that even though we haven't arrived, you accept us. And Lord, you want to show us your goodness. And so we just invite that to show, that you would show us a sign of your goodness, Lord, as we, as we give it all to you, as we surrender fully to you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. If you're a person and you have never given your heart to Jesus or you've never been forgiven by Jesus, I just want to say today is your day. You can, you can come to know the creator of the universe personally. He wants to know you and he wants you to know him. If that's you, could you just raise your hand right now? If you want to be forgiven for all your sins, yeah. You want to be forgiven and you want to have eternal life. You admit that you can't save yourself. Yeah, amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Lord, God. I, I just want to thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. Lord, I thank you that, that we can't save ourselves but you went to the cross so that we could have eternal life, so that we could live with the Father in heaven and that we could have impactful lives here on earth. Lord, we, we give it all we've got. We give it all to you, Lord, and we're just going to stand back and watch you blow us away with your faithfulness and your multiplication power in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Join us next week. We're going to talk about the woman caught in adultery. Woo! Sex in church. <laughs> no, I don't mean it like that. Okay, God bless you for those of you who are online. <laughs>